All right, welcome to episode number six of the Out of Bounds podcast. Josh Durso, Nate Sharman here inside the Finger Lakes One.com studio. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting stuff to get to this hour. We're talking about the FedEx Cup playoff finale this weekend. Uh, big storylines out of the BMW. Uh, but first, of course, we are getting to some really interesting developments with the PGA Live rivalry. Uh, it started with that meeting of the PGA's best last week, led by Tiger Woods. Uh, some updates, we first posted about it on TikTok five days ago, uh, a couple changes there. 10 to 12 no-cut golf tournaments with $20 million purses. The PGA Tour potentially dropping its nonprofit status, inviting private equity and investors into the fold, and guaranteed money for guys who don't qualify for the no-cut tournaments, which would consist of the top 60-ish players. Uh, how they get to that number remains to be seen, but uh, Nate, obviously that is a big development, and Maybe a little live-ish. Yeah, it definitely feels a little bit live-ish. But what I think is biggest is kind of what you said towards the end of there, that the tour would drop their not-for-profit status and, and welcome in private investors. I even heard as much as saying, like, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy could be interested in that sense, which I, which I find is really interesting and I think would be really awesome for the tour. They can continue to do, do good as they do on the tour with donations and stuff to different charities, and they can also kind of pay their players a little bit more money um, and get guys like Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy involved in kind of the investor status. So I kind of like this idea. Yeah, and it seemed like uh, it seemed a bit like a foregone conclusion that if the PGA Tour went this direction, uh, Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy would effectively be stakeholders in this, of course. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting. A lot of question about how that top sixty gets defined, right? That's an in, that's one area of question. Another is like. Would this create a bit of a playoff vibe throughout the entire year? Seems like it would because you'd have movement between, say, positions 50 and 70 at the very least, um, which would mean you'd have some jockeying. I heard this morning that there would also be a requirement to play, not a requirement, but players would be uh, in that top 60 would be allowed to play in a handful of the lower level tournaments uh, throughout the year. Obviously, you've got players like Jordan Spieth, uh, a bunch of others who have uh, events that they like to play. Mm -hmm. So Jordan Spieth always doing that Texas tour every year. Right, yep. um, it's like two or three tournaments. They would still be able to do that. Um, but I guess, you know, you start to wonder if this would have an effect on the way the FedEx Cup playoffs is structured. If the tour goes this direction, does it, does it, kind of derail what the FedEx Cup playoffs would look like? Yeah, definitely possibly could. It would be interesting interesting to see, like you said, Josh, how they kind of get to that top 60 and how they denote those top 60 players in those in that series of tournaments and how they would do FedEx Cup points. But another thing I would think is interesting, too, is it aligns perfectly with those WGC events that you see throughout the season. You know, those no-cut events, uh, technically, uh, typically a little bit higher purses, and they're a lot of fun to watch. You know, the cream rises to the top in those events. You have your big names du dueling it out on Sunday, great TV uh, ratings. People love watching those events. So I think this 10 to 12 event series, no cut series with $20 million purses, I think you really could see, like I said, the cream rise to the top and really watch these guys play well, go play great golf, and uh, contend on Sunday as well against each other. And when we posted this story to TikTok, it was interesting. A lot of the feedback that we got uh, kind of involved um, what the pipeline would look like or how this would affect those lower tier guys because there was some guaranteed money uh, discussed, maybe like an annual $500,000 payment to players who fall outside that top 60 and maybe uh, are still within the 150 or 125, whatever the case may be, Mark. Um, do you think this has an, or could have an impact on that pipeline, how the how the players move from, say, mini tour, college to uh, Corn Ferry or even interact with other tours like the DP World Tour uh, over the or the Atlantic? Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially if you have one of these these series events kind of going along opposite of a tournament, say the John Deere Classics, say any of these tournaments that's going to pull some of your top guys out of that event. Therefore, filling in the bottom bottom of those spots with guys that might be on the Corn Ferry Tour or, like you said, on the DP World Tour, that can kind of qualify for that event. And if they're able to 
you know, place in that event, earn FedEx Cup points, earn ranking points, and earn some money at the end of the day, that's going to be huge for their career. So I think they can kind of have an effect that this helps the top guys earn a lot more money and, and show their worth. And this can also help some of those bottom guys by giving them more opportunity to get into PGA Tour events and, and make cuts and, and establish themselves on the tour. I also think it's pretty awesome uh, that this would create a lot more exciting golf opportunity. So originally it was, it was uh, floated that there would be around 18 of these no-cut events, but what they, what they were actually pointing to was 18 total tournaments where you have the top-tier uh, players participating this includes majors yep. so it would be like 10 to 12 of these new events or newly marked events um, and it would almost be a scenario where every couple weeks you would have the best 60 players on tour participating and then you would have the the majors in addition to that I think that would for for what golf I think has been trying to capture with the FedEx Cup playoffs, I think it would do a great job of bringing that to the rest of the season, especially uh, earlier in the season when I think for the casual golf fan, it's a little bit confusing about when things really start, when things matter. Obviously, after the FedEx Cup playoffs wrap up this weekend, there's like a three or four week layoff and then the new season starts. And this would kind of confine the schedule to like January to August and I think would make it a little more, uh, it would make it a product that would be more consumable to the, the casual golf fan. Yeah, the only thing you run into doing too much in January, February is you run into the NFL season. Right. And as we know with any other sport on the planet, uh, the NFL is king. Yep. So it's going to be tough for, time for them to compete with that. But another thing that came out of that meeting too is we're going to see seven notable players that have played in the uh, FedEx Cup playoffs going to live. Um, they say one superstar that's likely to be Cam Smith. Um, if I had to guess, you know, and there's nothing that has been concrete come out of that, you'll see some other international guys like Mark Leishman go, possibly. Uh, Hideki Matsuyama's name's been rumored out there. That would be a big, huge loss for the tour, seeing as he's so popular over, overseas with, with fans. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see because we haven't seen a ton of guys that are of importance, of huge importance, leave for the Live Tour. I um, mean, obviously guys like DJ and Phil and, and, and Brooks. But you haven't seen guys in Bryson. You haven't seen guys that compete on a daily, on a weekly basis leave yet. So if you see a guy like Cameron Smith leave and then tr that trickles down into more and more players leave, that could be a real big problem. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, popularity for the most part is gauged by social interactions on social media and – TV viewership, broadcast uh, popularity. Um, I, I keep hearing this debate, and it connects back to this idea of, you know, oh, no, who is the PGA Tour going to lose next? I keep hearing this debate about how much the, the PGA Tour guys and live guys dislike each other, that maybe down the road there should be some sort of, like, rivalry event because they really just they, they despise each other that much. It's manufactured. I just don't see it. The PGA Tour product, no matter who the PGA Tour loses or who chooses to go to live, including Cam Smith, the PGA Tour product is not going to be less because of it. Cam Smith, nobody knew who he was two years ago, truthfully. Like, the, to the, ca the super casual right. golf fan, nobody knew who that was. Not a household name. Um, guys like Bryson DeChambeau, guys like Brooks Kepka, Phil Mickelson – they were around long enough to develop a brand. Now, the problem with when they left and why it didn't matter so much to a lot of the folks who watch uh, the, the kind of behind-the-scenes stuff with the tour closely is a pretty significant amount of time and a bunch of injuries piled up between when they were dominant and winning regularly, excluding Phil's obvious win at the PGA a couple of years ago, um, and when they went to live. So you've got this gap that was created. Brooks had a bunch of knee issues. He's got health issues. Hadn't really done a ton of winning. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau, he's gone through the, the – he's run the gambit, I guess, in, in terms of, you know, he has these peaks and valleys, um, but was never this in and out every single year contender. Um, it was either feast or famine, it seemed. You know, he'd, he'd contend at one event. One It could be a major. It could be a, a big tour event. And then miss – 
a handful of cuts or just be a non-factor for a, a long stretch. Losing Cam Smith, while I think there would be some immediate sting, I don't think there's any long-term impact. And overall, I'm kind of, it doesn't matter who the, the seven are that go. I don't think it makes a big difference in any of those popularity markers that I mentioned in the beginning, which is social media and TV, which are the two major ways that popularity is determined in, in sports in general. I mean, that's just it. Right. Yeah, I agree. Those seven guys um, as a whole right now aren't going to make a huge difference from them leaving to live. I just think that it could, it, and I've said this kind of from the beginning too, is I think that you could have a big trickle-down effect. So if you get guys like Cam Smith and some other big big names, big players that contend on the PGA Tour you know, a lot, almost every week, you could get guys saying, oh, well, I want to play against the best. So they could, maybe they could go to live. That could be a factor for them, um, not, not, not also just a ton of money that they could get in that uh, effect too. But that always kind of scares me, that if you lose Cam Smith, you lose some other big names that other big names could follow. I think if you look at the – if you took a snapshot at the conclusion of each of the last, say, six years of the top 10 or 20 or 30 best golfers in the world, um, what you'd see is a lot of, a lot of movement, right. right? So not a lot of consistency. Unlike the, the – you know, think back to the eras of the, the Tiger Woods, David Duvall, Phil Mickelson, the guys that for a span of years hung in very kind of like set places – um, I can remember growing up through the, through the 2000s and literally knowing where players sat in the world golf ranking because they just moved so infrequently. Right. So, you know, going, connecting the dots back to this, I don't think unless you saw in one single move, like right now we saw seven of the top 20 players in the world go to live as soon as the FedEx Cup playoffs is over. I don't think it makes, I don't think it has any impact, this, these seven players that move. And I, you know, I think what you're describing would take years right. to accomplish, right? Like they would have to chip away. And these players, it goes back to the fundamental issue, I think, with live. These players have to, like, continue to maintain themselves as best player status and I don't understand, like, Cam, say Cam Smith goes. He's the second best player in the world right now. A year from now, how is he any different from any other player who hasn't played in a tour event, a sanctioned event, in a year? Are we still just going to say, well, he's still the second best player in the world, even though we haven't seen him play any golf against a competitive field since? Yeah, that's a good point. You're easily forgotten about. I mean, it's like look at Bryson DeChambeau. We haven't really heard much about him. I, I saw a YouTube video up. He's about him. He's been doing his, his social media stuff, which is really fun to watch. Bryson's a great personality in that regard. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you drop out of those world, you drop out of that world golf ranking points by not being able to earn points um, on your tour. And you essentially could get forgetting, forgotten about very easily, but you have your hundred million. So you don't and worry about that's much, the I thing. Guess. That's what I, I keep coming back to is I don't think any of these guys care. No, they don't. It, right. they're, 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 they made this decision because it's the best decision for them. They didn't look at it from a political standpoint. They didn't look at it from a golf legacy standpoint. They're looking at it from a best for me, best for my family, best for my future decision. Do you That's think they're it. kicking themselves now that they hear about this possible tour inside a tour thing? I doubt it because I think I I think no matter what, Liv will be able to offer a better guaranteed scenario than the tour. See this this whole thing with uh, with the the top sixty is great but there's going to be volatility in that top 60 if you have a bad stretch you could fall out of the top 60 and all of a sudden you're not included and you know i don't think it would take very long because of what the tour is trying to do i think they're going to try to build something that is very playoff like and very exciting i don't think it's going to necessarily reward guys who had a good stretch between may and july of last year mm -hmm. so you know what's the i I think for guarantee, if you're if you're strictly comparing the two by guarantees, I think the live guys are going to be happier with their decision long term than you know having any kind of like you know buyer's remorse with jumping on with that instead of sticking with the tour. I think there could be a little bit though when they drop if they drop that non for profit status and they start giving out twenty million dollar purses and events and 
they have a little bit more n name recognition, a lot more rain name recognition with fans. I think there could be a little bit of buyer's remorse, but I guess that remains to be seen. Well, it depends on how much of that money flows in right. because it could be a lot. It could get it could get really interesting. Like it may never get to you know the the Saudi level investment that we've seen with Liv, but it could very well get to like a a really influential point when you combine the the presence and the weight that the tour already carries. They've already got the TV deals. They've already got the branding that everybody knows. They've already got the legacy. They've already got the events that are ingrained in golf fans like from birth practically. Mm -hmm. You've got all that plus you add billions of dollars and you know investors who have different ideas and you know you sort of gamify golf a little more which I think the next thing we're going to be talking about is that gamification of competitive golf I, I think there's far more potential on the tour side to do something that's really interesting to grow the game than what live will be able to do having to build it from the ground up yeah I like that transition what do you think about this new kind of stadium series that Tiger and Rory have kind of announced that could kind of take place at the beginning of the year when golf's kind of at its lowest I think now part of me wonders how exactly this would work with the schedule that we just talked about right because right. like these High-profile world golf-like events are going to be happening in that same January to August window, right, leading up to the playoffs. So then you also have these kind of exhibition for money uh, competitions that are going to be taking place apparently in stadiums across the United States and I, I would assume world um, for additional money between January and March when things are really kind of lulled out. Um, I really like the concept. I, I think this is a cool way to get future generations into golf. And, and, you know, I thought I went back to when I was a kid and, you know, we've watched other sports have um, this ability for young people to be able to mimic what they're seeing. So backyard baseball, pickup basketball, mm -hmm. kind of hard to emulate what you see on tour in your backyard right you can't really simulate a 72 hole round you know you can kind of do a little like pitch and putt thing or you know uh if you got your playstation that's about it right and i think introducing a basically a skills challenge which it sounds like that's what it would sort of be is a top golf inspired uh skilled skills challenge i think that kind of sets the table for a, a different kind of young golf fan to find golf and then be able to interact with golf and you know it's a it's a positive i also think that again because of the the tour um and the people who are involved uh the ease of getting this on tv because it looks like nbc is going to be involved from the start in this thing um i think they're going to have a lot a, a lot easier time selling this to people than um, Liv has had selling their product. So, you know, I think it, I think it's awesome. What do, what do you think in terms of this as a as a different kind of golf product as opposed to the one that we see ever, which is just stroke play uh, uh, tournaments, whether they three, four, whatever rounds. I think it's awesome for the young golfer. You know, instead of trying to sell a either either a young golfer or a, or a beginner golfer looking to get into the game and, and being kind of exposed to it. You don't have to sell eight hours a day, four days. You don't have to sell, you don't have to sell over 30 hours of whether it be watching, watching the leaderboard, watching your DraftKings lineup. You know, it's not something you'd have to spend a lot of time on. You know, it can be something you sit down at 7 o'clock or whatever time it's at and watch for, you know, a couple hours, an hour or two, and you go out in your backyard and say, oh, I want to try chipping into this bucket. Yeah. You know, it's just like kind of how – if it's going to be a top golf inspired things, I'm sure there'll be those kind of those kind of challenges. You know, I want to try to chip into this bucket or chip into my pool and put a tube out there and see what I can do there. So I think uh, kids or new golfers will be able to kind of watch that and go try to emulate it for sure. Yeah, and I think it's going to be. We, we keep hearing that it's going to be tech forward, very tech forward. Um, I think that fits too uh, with the amount of new golf tech we see every day um, and how it's becoming less intrusive, less expensive for, for players, young people, anyone really to get their hands on it. Um, as opposed to, you know, it can get pretty pricey to go play 18 holes of golf. Yeah. 
So, you know, it, it lowers the lowers the bar in terms of barrier to entry, which I think is awesome for yeah. growing the game, actually growing the game. Um, let's shift gears and talk about what uh, everything that happened this past week. And obviously, uh, we had BMW Championship. Uh, Patrick Cantlay, he wins, unsurprisingly, it seems. he's all, He's been hanging around for weeks, finally gets a win in position to maybe win this thing this weekend. Uh, we'll get into that later, but um, Will Zell Torres, uh, just kind of a, a devastating four-day stretch for anybody who's a fan of his. Obviously withdrew from the, the tournament last weekend, and now we know uh, will not be able to uh, play moving forward. He's definitely not playing this weekend, and frankly, it doesn't look like he's going to be playing golf for a while. He's got two herniated discs. Yep. Um and I couldn't help but have flashbacks to the, the Jason Day uh, career trajectory. You know, this guy who was, you know, one of the best in the world and then had physical condition just, you know, basically shoot him down the list. And he, you, you worry because he's gotten so close. Zelatoris has gotten so close, and it seemed like he broke through, and now here we are talking about a back injury where we literally don't know if he's going to play golf again this year. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's an it's an over five million dollar injury, if you think about it. I mean, he's in the top ten of the FedEx Cup as long as he plays would play okay golf in the Tour Championship. He'd kind of find himself in that, you know, five to ten range. He might even be able to come back and even better than that. So. You're looking at a three or four million dollar purse. The, the winnings from the BMW Championship. He wasn't contending in that, but he was in the middle of the pack, so he was yeah. set to win a good amount of money there too. So, if you think about it too, this has to be a devastating injury for him to do that. Because if, I mean, you would think about a guy maybe he's playing a little bit hurt. You, you take a look at your Tour Championship, where you've played all year, how successful he's been all season with ten top ten, ten top tens in a win just a few weeks ago, and put himself in that really prime position. And then to have to withdraw is got to be a, just a gut wrenching decision that Will and his camp have had to make because he's just so much he's done all season to put himself in this position and to win a lot of money, a big payday. So you just feel for him. It's just really unfortunate. Well, I'm playing devil's advocate there. I mean, sure, the money that he loses this year is one thing, but if he were to play, the money that right. he loses through the rest of his career, if this injury becomes even worse, then he's, you know, unable to play he's only 26 years old yeah 26 years old i mean you know i it's it's one of those things where i just hope we see him back next year no no expectations prior to that at all you just want to see him get back and still be able to play at the level that he's been playing at up until this injury how much do you think it bothered him during his win at the saint jude you know it was only three weeks ago yeah, and I, I kind of wonder if it wasn't something that perhaps had been masked for a period of time or if it was something that literally happened afterward. Right. And, you know, back injuries can be really finicky. They can they can show themselves in, in really bizarre fashion. That you can, you know, it, you can hurt yourself in seemingly mundane ways. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, again, it's just a, it's a tough, it's a really tough, situation for him for yeah. sure and we'll talk about the president's cup a little bit more coming up but having to drop out of that and there's so much pride that goes along with that so we'll have to fill his position patrick Cantley, he got the win though uh what what did you uh what did you take from from that uh that weekend his performance overall yep just played patrick Cantley level of golf right i mean not doesn't make a lot of mistakes uh, got a really really good bounce towards the end um, I think well, actually was on 18. Hit his drive down the right side. It was heading right to the bunker. Bounced short of the bunker. Left over the bunker. Bounced again in the rough and bounced out in the middle of the fairway. <laughs> and so it's. I mean, obviously golf is a game of member kick. bounces, but I mean, still a well deserved win. I saw a cool stat uh, by the tour. That's his, this is his sixth win since October 2020. That's the most on tour. Six wins in, in just about two years. It's pretty on pretty remarkable. Eight total wins in his career for uh, Patrick Cantlay. And he's one of those guys that. Um, it, it shows just how much volatility there has been in professional golf over the last several years. And he's it's, got such a cool story, too. He is a, he is a legitimately top-tier golfer 
and it's it is it's it's really impressive. He's always hanging around every every week. We've been talking about it now for like four weeks. He's always just kind of hanging around in the leaderboard into the weekend. And when he was an amateur, he had those back injuries where he thought he thought his camp thought he may never play golf again. Yeah. I mean, he had two major back surgeries and also lost the lost one of his best friends to, to a tragic accident, which was really really hard on his life and his golf game as well. So it's pretty cool the perseverance that Patrick has been able to kind of battle through and and win another golf tournament and set him up in perfect position to win this tour championship. Um, coming out of that, though, I thought there were a couple really cool stories coming out of the BMW. It's always so much fun to watch the end of that tournament because you have so much volatility inside that top 30 guys trying to make it in yeah. in there into that top 30. You had Adam Scott, who was on 18. He needed to make par to, to be in, to be on the, that number 29 number. Hits a second shot in the bunker. Hits an excellent bunker shot to about four or five feet. Knocks it in. It's just cool for the journeyman, or journeyman Adam Scott, you know, mas former Masters champion, to do that. Uh, a guy that we've talked about on this podcast, Ahithi Gala, played really well on the way in. Snuck in on number 28. He made a, like a 37 or 40 footer on 17, and then he made about a six footer for par on 18 to get in. So pretty cool to see the PGA Tour rookie making it east like. It's huge. It's absolutely huge, especially for a guy like that. That changes the trajectory overall, I think, for what the expectations become next year and the year beyond that. Obviously, if you're in positions 20 through 30, likelihood of you winning um, this tournament this weekend are pretty slim unless you go absolutely nuclear. Um, but, again, it's, it sets everybody up, and everybody, all of these guys are going to get life-changing money yep. at, the end of the, at the end of the road. So. And they can shoot 80, 80, 80, 80 this week, and they get $500,000. Not to mention, the Tour just announced they're going to let them all into the Century Tournament of Champions, yep. which is another... No cut event. Yeah, it'll earn you money, and also it gets you some exemptions into a couple majors. Yeah, Which, so it's just it's life changing for the for a guy like Figala, a guy like Aaron Wise, to sneak in there inside that top thirty and play another week on the PGA Tour. So it's just such cool stuff. All right, let's get into it. Tour Championship this weekend: East Lake, Georgia, eighteen million to the winner. Runner up gets six and a half million. Last place gets 500000 although I think uh, Will Zelatoris has claimed that money by default since he isn't able to play this week, and I'm pretty sure I saw PGA Tour comms um, tweet that out at some point that uh, that he would get the money and uh, there would only be 29 in the field. Um, interesting golf course, 7,300 yards, so it's not, it's not a pitch-and-putt golf course by any means. What are you looking at uh, this weekend in terms of course and who you're watching uh, to potentially maybe maybe make a run at this thing. I like golf courses that finish in a par five. Yeah. Makes for a lot of fun drama. Uh, you see, you saw Rom there a couple of years ago with a, with a really, really good drama. But my pick this week, Xander Schauffele. Starts the day at six, starts the tournament at six under. We'll talk a little bit more about that staggered start and how we feel about that too coming up. But um, I think Xander is just so solid. I mean, you take a look at Justin Ray on Twitter. Xander hasn't shot over par on a Sunday in two years. That's unreal. Yeah, it's a. He he's he was in he was in the uh, in contention last week. I expect him to be in contention this week. Um, does shot like I said sh starts the day at four on or uh, six under par four back of the lead, but I, I expect him to play well and, and contend in this tournament. How about you? A lot of, there's a, there's a lot of those guys that are really good at hanging around. Mm -hmm. um, I think the stack. We're gonna talk more about the staggered start issue I, I have an issue with the staggered start that said um i feel like it's hard to pick against patrick cantley in this scenario but my gut tells me that scotty scheffler of old i guess of spring mm -hmm. uh i think he comes back this week i think we see him play the golf that a lot of people expected to see him play from the start of the FedEx Cup playoffs, or hope to see him play from the start of the FedEx Cup playoffs. So my pick, Scheffler. That's it. Okay. We'll see how it goes. I like it. See how it goes. We'll see about this time next week uh, if we have another winner on, on this podcast. Yeah, let's talk about that staggered start. Uh, you know, I'll go first because I love it. I think it's a really good idea because back a few years ago when they used to just play a regular tournament, you could have a guy that wins the tournament, a.k.a. Tiger Woods, I believe that was 2018, but does not win the FedEx Cup. Right. And I think that can be a little bit confusing to fans, including myself, you know, kind of trying to figure out where guys are in terms of the, the number of where they are in the FedEx Cup and where they are in the tournament. And then you get to the 18th green and you have, you crown your champion and you crown your FedEx Cup champion. 
So yeah. it just seems like there's a lot kind of brewing in that. So I think the staggered start idea rewards how you've played all season, and it puts you in that position to, to win East Lake and win the tour cham- or win the tour championship. But maybe how they do it in terms of giving a ton of points out in the playoffs can be retweaked a little bit. But I'd love to hear. I know you've kind of t- toured that match play idea around a little bit, so I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm 50-50 on it because obviously this is better than the old system, right? Like you just mentioned, it, there's there's no disputing that part of it. But it feels like it could be better. And I think that the match play format would be that as opposed to trying to do another stroke play event where you're kind of presetting guys in different spots based on how they've played up to that point. Um, it doesn't it doesn't need to change, but I just think this is a really good opportunity for the tour to uh, bring something different into the fold. Like obviously this event is different than any of the other events on the calendar, right? Like we don't see players starting ahead of ahead of or behind the, the, the leader based on anything. So this is that part of it is unique. But the match play format, I think, would be more interesting. I just think you would you would really get more of that head to head battle on Sunday f- to see between two people who the best player is that year. Right. And, you know, every system is going to have drawbacks, but I think in terms of what the tour seems like it wants to do, which is make itself stand out by trying to do some unique things uh, with competition, I think introducing another match play uh, event is a great way to do that, especially with it being here. Now, that said... I've heard a lot of I've heard a lot of critics of that idea on social media say that well East Lake isn't the best venue for that. You couldn't really do that at East Lake. Okay, then let's make the playoffs four again. Let's add an extra event and extend it one week. So move it back. Either move the start back. You'd probably want to move the start back one week because of the the obvious you know presence the ever presence of the NFL. Uh, but I think. If after East Lake there were, say, one more event where it was a eight person, sixteen per, I don't know, whatever the case may be, where the the drama can build a little more, I think that's an opportunity. And I think match play is is the best format for what the tour is trying to accomplish, which is why it is the solution that I would propose if I were at the table. I'm not at the table though, so. I'm just here on a podcast talking about golf. I think one thing that they get worried about with match play is that when you get to that final match, there's just quite frankly not a lot of golf going on. So you take a look at the TV. They have to go. They go to commercial more. They talk more in the booth, and and that can be something that kind of deters fans, just because you have you have two guys playing in that last match. You know, they once they hit their approach shots, they have to walk 150, 170 yards in, and there's not quite frankly not a lot to show. So that's, I think that's the only thing they get worried about match play is that they can kind of maybe lose a couple of viewers on late on a Sunday, you know, not wanting to watch uh, endless commercials and watch guys talk about golf in the booth. And you'd probably lose a lot, and that's probably the number one reason why it will never happen. Right. But I, It's cool to talk about. It's, like it. it's interesting because I do think that the tour has gotten to a point now where there are enough annual conversations about – how this last tournament is formatted, that the tour is going to have to do something to change it. I don't think the staggered start is going is the the right formula. I think it needs to be modified in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's just less staggering. Maybe it's a tighter, you know, compacting it a little more, or maybe it's a tiered kind of thing um, where you get like, you know, the top five guys starting mm-hmm. at the same level, and yeah, then you know, that. rather than you know, separating, basically separating everybody by a couple strokes, it just really creates a pretty, uh, pretty big gap for, for some people to overcome. For sure. All right, let's announce the teams for the uh, President's Cup. They came out on Sunday after the, after the tournament was over. We'll start with the American team. Sam Burns, Patrick Cantlay, Tony Finau, Xander Schauffele, Scotty Scheffler, and Justin Thomas. That's a pretty strong team. Very. <laughs> wow. Very. Even without Will Zalatoris, you know, losing to injury. Um, that's that. Those guys are going to be tough to beat. And if you take a look at two, uh, Captain Davis Love, not going to lose. I would say any of those guys to live. Which, no. when we get to the international team here pretty soon, that could be a huge portion. 
So the international team also has announced uh, Canadian Corey, T- Corey Connors, Sanjay M, Tom Kim, Hideki Matsuyama, Hoki Neiman, Mito Pereira, Adam Scott, and Live Tour member, possibly, Cameron Smith. Also a strong team, but could have a little bit of fun there replacing some guys. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's tough. Um, I don't think there's a clear answer to who Zalatoris' replacement should be. And if we lose um, a couple players, maybe three players from the international team to the Live Tour, frankly, I'm not even sure it's going to be that exciting. Granted, players can have bad weeks, players can have great weeks, and golf is really deep right now, so I, I'm not going to make any guarantees. But I, I think that given the timing of all of this, um, it's it's tough to say what that product that weekend is going to look like. Yeah, it's, it's not really far tough. from now. You know, we're just in a, the end of September. Uh, I think it's the 25th, 26th at Quail Hollow. So uh, we'll be really excited to watch that. I love watching team golf, especially when it goes back to their nationalities and kind of how they play for that, too, is, is so much fun. But, yeah, Liv is going to really make its impact on that. Who uh, who's your pick to uh, be Zalatoris' replacement? It seems like you've given this a little bit of thought. Um, probably Figala. You have guys like JT Poston who could also be a a, uh, a great idea for that. But I think Figala kind of deserves it. You know, he's one poor shot away from winning a PGA Tour event this season. Right, made it to East Lake. Um, as long as he comes out and plays well this week, he's going to really kind of show his name and, and how much fun he is to watch. So I I think he could get in. Yeah, it's interesting because I think there's there's so many players in that, we'll call it 15 to 25 range, that all at different times have really shown, a, a, you know, given plenty of reason for, uh, for that for they them to be picked, yeah. um, and it it'll be interesting to see. I, I I'm far more curious to see how the international side goes about replacing three players if they do end up losing three players to live. And what impact that has, because I, I just can't imagine, I, me personally, I can't imagine it's going to be very fun to watch the President's Cup if it winds up being as lopsided as it feels like it could be. Right. I mean, not too long ago, we had the Ryder Cup that was lopsided. That was before Liv happened. Right. So the American team is just so strong. So many good players. Uh, we got a little uh, USGA men's amateur results. Uh, talk us through what we have going on there. Yep. The Texas A&M Aggie, Sam Bennett, defeated uh, one up against Ben Carr. Um Sam Bennett took a really strong lead. They played 36 holes um, at each course on Sunday. And uh, it, S- Bennett had the five-up lead through 22 holes. And uh, Carr was able to fire back at him. He chipped one in off the green. He made one uh, from the fringe off the green. And I think Sam Bennett was a little bit kind of nervous, but he got through it and, and won that event. So congratulations to Sam Bennett, 100 se- 122nd U.S. Am- amateur champion. Uh, so pretty cool out of him. Saw some cool pictures as he was flying back uh, to Texas to start. I believe he's a fifth-year senior to, senior to start that his uh, last call, collegiate golf season and kind of saw him with a cup, so pretty cool story. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think at some point here we're going to end up talking, uh, in a future episode we're going to talk about pace of play and some of the rather poor examples that we're seeing from these elite golfers um, of just really abysmal pace of play. Um, yeah. you, can, you can be elite. You can be a, a, among the best athletes on the planet. Um, but unfortunately, there are uh, golf may have a a time spent over the golf ball issue uh, in the coming years. Plus, that was match play too. So yeah, you only have one match going on, like we said. Uh, but more interestingly, at least from my perspective, especially for the the average uh, golf uh, golf fan, uh, PGA 2K23, it's coming. Tiger's back. Couple months. Tiger's back. Tiger's the poster boy for it. Super exciting stuff. Um, and super exciting for any, I guess, millennial or, or Gen Z who grew up playing, um, you know, the Tiger Woods franchise through the 90s and 2000s. Um, obviously, the the video game world has changed quite a bit. It's not quite the same as it was a decade ago. Um, but this seems to have a lot of promise. Uh, what, what are you feeling and thinking? A uh, little bit nostalgic, maybe? Yeah, a little bit, and I think it's really cool that they're going to have Michael Jordan as a playable character. Right. Um, I think that really resonates with golf, with non-golf fans, that they can go play with a guy like that, a guy that's not 
a guy that's a golfer, of course, but not, not in the golf landscape. So I think that's really cool. I think they're going to do a really good job letting you play as all the players on tour and letting you play for, with some fun, unlockable characters. So I think that's going to be really, really fun, and we're going to see that pretty soon. October 14th is the uh, date it drops. Um, if you want to pay a little extra money, you can play it on the 11th <laughs> of October. So Four days. <laughs> yep, you can have a little bit of uh, extra access. just costs a couple more dollars, but... Um, I think it's worth it in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> we might be just a little bit overexcited about this. Hey, that's going to do it for this week's episode. Uh, you can drop us a line by emailing out of bounds at fingerlakes1.com. You can also check us out on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Just search out of bounds F O one on Twitter or IG, uh, or out of bounds golf pod on TikTok. For Nate Sharman, I'm Josh Durso. And remember, whether it's down the middle or out of bounds, keep on swinging. 